says, for the Pharisees, and this is Mark commenting here for us, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they uh, had come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Okay, so to us that may seem like a, a random and an unimportant question, but to them it's a very important question. Um, why were the Pharisees so concerned about the disciples not washing their hands before they, they ate? Now, Right, You and I live in a world where uh, washing hands is kind of an important thing. We even have in our hospitals and other places uh, of business these days those little hand sanitizing stations. Very good, very convenient, helps us prevent disease. It's very hygienic. That's an important consideration. Believe it or not, that's actually not the, the thing that the, the Pharisees are really getting at here. As important as that was to them, as important as that was to God, even in the old law, he put in some level of hygiene code or, or, or law or, or commandments to keep the, the people of Israel healthy to some extent. But that wasn't his major concern there. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, who know the law of Moses so, so very well, uh, have taken that law and over time what they tried to do was make that law easier to handle. Uh, we're talking about 613 or so commandments for people to keep track of under the old law, under the Jewish system. And so that's a lot to do. And so what they tried to do, and it, noble intentions here, was to give the uh, people a, an oral law, spoken law, around that that would help them accomplish that task. Good intentions sometimes go astray. And, and as time went by, that oral law that they set up sort of as the, the, the scholars and the commentators tell me it's a, it's a hedge around the law for protection to make sure that the law wasn't you know, violated. Um, but, but over time, that hedge became to some degree a little more important than the law itself, including uh, this, this uh, law that they're talking about here uh, came from the oral law. It's not something that was in Moses' law that said that they had to wash their hands in this specific way. And it was very specific where they had to dip their hands in water, hold them at a certain angle so that the water would drip down to their elbows and, and fully cover their hands. And then that water had to make sure that they, they disposed of that water so it didn't get into, on, onto something else or someone else because that becomes contaminated. And then um, if you uh, touch someone with those contaminated hands and they were unclean, even though really that's not a, an unhygienic thing, that's just a matter of their minds saying, we need to make sure we keep this law. And we've, we've turned it into uh, a, a, a sort of a straw man in front of this. So it's elaborate, these washings. Anything that they deemed unclean needed to be washed. And that was a long list. This was not a matter of hygiene, but, but it was a matter of defying the Pharisees' so-called authority. Because at this day and time, the Pharisees were, were at the top. They had authority, they had uh, reputation among the people of being the, the ones who know the law and could expound on the law and give them the, the, the information that the people needed. Jesus and his disciples come in, and to them, it's their authority is being undermined. And so they bring this topic up to, to find out if they can, can uh, sort of defrock or um, make Jesus and his disciples look bad. Who taught that it was wrong to eat without performing this ritual washing ceremony? Was it a teaching of man or was it a teaching of God? Think about that for a minute. Was it a teaching of man or was it a teaching of God? The original idea of, of, of staying clean, of being clean people, yeah, that may come from God. There's some things about that in the old law. But they had taken that and, and turned it into something bigger and, and had a very specific amount of things that, that needed to be done to keep, to keep someone clean. So that is a teaching of man more than it is a teaching of God. Uh, let's, let's go on. Chapter, six, uh, chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Uh, we'll stop there for just a minute. What did Jesus call them? What, what bad word, what difficult uh, uh, word does he use there? Hypocrites. Uh, and that's a word that we toss around a lot. 
in the religious world, um, and, and that's thrown at us as Christians. Sometimes people are, are very ready to, to suggest that anybody who says that they're a Christian uh, and, and acts a certain way is hypocritical, and I'll admit some of that because I would, I would suggest that all of us to some extent are hypocrites, and, and I am one of those, and, and, and really the word just means pretending to be better than they are. Or, or something other than what they are. And I suppose that's all of us because we, in one sense, it's good to be a hypocrite because we are trying to be better than what we really are as Christians. But in the sense that, that Jesus puts it across here, it's a very negative term. Uh, Jesus was frustrated that they just had this blatant inconsistency and unfairness in what they expected of the people versus what they expected of themselves. Where were their hearts? Where were their hearts in this passage? The Pharisees and scribes said many good things. They taught many good things. They're trying to communicate the will of God to the people. That's good. That, the intention of the oral traditions, the oral law, that was noble. But when those traditions began to take precedence over God's law, that was a sign to Jesus of a corrupting heart, a heart that was degrading, a heart that was interested in something more than just God's uh, betterment, God's will. Traditions. When, when those traditions took precedence, is what I said. So tradition, that's a word we have to define for a minute. Do you have traditions in your family? Are there certain things that you do at certain times of the year, maybe around uh, Christmas time or uh, summer vacation that you always go on? There are certain places that you always go. You have these family traditions. Are those bad things? No. We've got lots of things like that in my family that, that we really enjoy. But when that tradition becomes something negative or, or, or is perceived as negative, then we've got a bit of a problem. The tradition that we're talking about here is, is a, it's a Greek word. It's, it's the original word behind this is, is actually two words that come together that have to mean uh, something about handing down, something that is handed down to the next generation maybe. Traditions can be helpful, uh, and sometimes they can be not so helpful, and sometimes they can degrade over time. In matters of faith, though, in matters of Scripture, when traditions become the focus over the intentions of Scripture, we have traveled far from the heart of God. Our, fart, our, our hearts travel far away from Him. And what is the effect of that? When our hearts travel away from God, Jesus told them that their worship of God was vain. Let's continue reading. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother whatever you have, would have gained from me as Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. Jesus told them back in, uh, uh, let's see, make sure I get this right. Verse 7, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus tells them that because their hearts have traveled so far away from him, that their worship has become vain. What does it mean for something to be vain? Um, no, it's not me standing in front of the mirror and staring at myself and primping for two hours. That's a different kind of vein here. Uh, this is a vanity that is, is talking about meaninglessness. It has no meaning. It's lost its effect. Jesus told them that their worship to God, the thing that they offer to God, their devotion, their worship, their, their um, allegiance, was in vain. All because they took God's commandments, set them aside, and let their ideas that had built up over centuries take precedence, be more important than God's commands. Does that sound dangerous to you? It sounds very, very dangerous to me. Jesus told them that their worship of God was vain, meaningless, and pointless. Can it get that way? Can our hearts wander so far away from God that, that our worship that we've been offering this morning and the way that we do it becomes vain, becomes pointless? Is that possible? I want to read a couple of passages to you from the Old Testament. Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. This is God's words coming from Amos, and, and, and he says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. 
Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. At this point in Israel's history, things have gotten so bad that God says, I cannot accept your worship. The worship that I prescribed in the Old Testament, these offerings, very detailed commandments of God, I can't accept that anymore because your hearts are not where they need to be. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and of the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Uh, even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. So even in their worship, even if their worship was in the correct form, as it was in these cases in the Old Testament, God got to the point where he was not pleased unless their devotion, their, their, their true devotion was intact. I know that we don't live under the Old Testament anymore. We'll talk about that maybe some more next week. But here, here we have these ideas, these principles. We see a picture of who God is, and it's a frustrated God. It's not so much, I think, an angry, uh, belligerent God as much as a frustrated and hurt God. You've taken my commandments the way that I designed for this to be with, with the correct heartfelt emotion intact, and you've, you've distorted that. You've obliterated that. How dare you? <laughs> he knew that they had to let go of him, that, that they had let go of him, and were holding to their own idea of what is right. Don't pretend to be righteous when you're not doing what's right. That's what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees in Mark chapter 7. Those last section we read, verses 9 through 13, you know, what, what had they sacrificed in order to establish their system of commands? It says that they rejected. They set aside God's law. And, and he said, actually, that they're very good at it. He says, you have a fine way. You're, you're very good at setting aside God's law. That's kind of one of those left-handed compliments. It doesn't mean what you think it means. And, and what did Moses actually say? And he brings up this, this case in point example here of this law of Corbin. What did Moses actually say? Who said that we should honor our parents? It's in the Ten Commandments to honor your father and mother. Who said that? Well, you know, it came out of Moses' mouth, uh, but it was written down by God on the tablets of stone. It's a commandment from God specifically. Who came up with the idea of this, this, this thing, Corbin, this Corbin idea? Well, that was the Jews. <laughs> that was part of the hedge around the law. The, the Jewish leaders, they came up with this idea that it, its intentions may have been noble in the beginning to, to have money and possessions that were dedicated to God's service. That's what that Corbin word means, to dedicate something fully to God. It has no other purpose except to be used in God's service. Very noble intentions in the beginning. But over time, greed creeps in, and this concept basically turns into sort of a tax shelter <laughs> where you get to keep this, this uh, money, these possessions out of everyone's reach to be used for your own purposes maybe at some point later. Essentially, they had found a way around God's command and, though, and thought that they had the authority to permit this action, the Pharisees did. And, and I wonder where, where the offerings were going uh, in the end, maybe back around to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So there's money involved here, and, and that always corrupts people's intentions. Is it possible for us, I hope you're, you're following me along here, um, and I, I get confusing sometimes. Is it possible for us to limit the power of God's word? Because I see that happening here in this situation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, um, you, you may already know it well. I'm going to read it to you just as a reminder. Romans chapter 1, 
and verse 16. I think we know that this is true, and it's frustrating for us. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews.